You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Executive Nurse Advisor Dr. Batchelor will present the significant role nurses play in providing health care in a multitude of health care settings. Listen to some of today's key nurses who work and practice in academia settings and talk about the challenges they face in today's modern medical world. So please welcome the host of All About Nursing, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Good evening. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, and we're live on the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio. And I have a very interesting guest with me this evening, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. This is Toy Martin. She is a professional keynote speaker, author, and change coach. She's also a registered nurse, a mother, and a diehard optimist. She believes change is far too important to leave to chance. So she wrote a book, Living Your Life with Possibilities, to share her innovative approach to creating beneficial change. She is a native Texan. She has two baccalaureate degrees from Midwestern State University in health and fitness management and in nursing and an MBA from, the, from Texas Tech, which led her to working as a change consultant. She has transformed current methods used for change in organizations into a universal change method that anyone can apply to grow and achieve their possibilities. So welcome to the show. To the show. So, Toy, maybe we could start with you you telling us. Oh, absolutely. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the consulting and speaking you do. What are the major issues that you and your team are asked to address? You know, the major things that we come across over and over, all of the things that kind of circle around change and um, that constant change that we're going through and all of the things that leads to, like, burnout change, fatigue, frustration, um, you know, chaos, just the disruption around that and the environment that that creates. So as I was listening to you say all that, I was thinking to myself, that's what we were doing before the pandemic with COVID-19. And I'm just curious what you anticipate post, like what we're doing now in terms of after the (laughs) pandemic and just all of the noise in the system. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that. Uh, you know, it's so interesting. You know, I, I started out in med surge and I, I climbed my way up the ladder and I got up to director of nursing and everything kind of started to change. And at, at that point, even though I had, had been really successful in my position and had created, you know, a lot of great things, I all of a sudden felt really incompetent, or at least I felt that way. And, and because of all of the change going on, and all coming from different departments, you know, coming from the business department and, and things that were in a whole different language than what we understood. And it was such a profound feeling to me that I, I turned my career around and I was set to start my master's in nursing. And I said, you know what, I think this is going to be really important to understand the business side and the clinical side, you know, of healthcare. And I, I think it was two weeks and I was sitting in my MBA class and really changed that. It's, you know, I think, I think change is really underrated and we don't really realize um, the effect on it, the effect that it has on staff and things like that. One of, one of the most profound things that I came across when I was, when I was doing my MBA, I was in a class, I believe it was on organizational change. And we're talking about this subject, and I'm like, I was really excited because I knew something finally. Everything else seemed like a foreign language, but I knew what we were talking about at that point. And it was the change curve. And in the business section of, of the world, 
they use this change curve to for leaders to kind of see where employees are and what they're likely to experience as they go through change in the organization and in the workplace. Well, this change curve is Kubler-Ross's death and dying model. <laughs> and her grief, her grief model, and I'm not kidding you, it's in their text. No, I'm and sure. It organiz- it, and I just kept thinking, is it is it okay to knowingly put people into grief over and over? Like, is that mm-hmm. a good thing? And, of course, I'm, I'm the only nurse in this whole business thing. And I'm like, why is nobody asking if this is healthy for our well-being? And you know what? It was so profound. I said, you know, you know what? I don't think it's healthy. And I set out to find a better way. So how long had you practiced as a nurse before you decided that you really needed to potentially change your course of focus? Because you said that you started as a med surge nurse. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I started as a med surge nurse. And then I went, you know, into the flow pool and then to house supervisor and then manager over the house supervisors and um, patient flow. And that was all at a level two trauma center. And I was there for about 10 years. And um, then I, I left there and I went to go work as a director of nursing at a smaller facility. And that was about, it was about 12 years in when everything really started to change for me. And I made that decision to, to go and learn, you know, the other side, the non-clinical side. Um, so I've been a nurse for 20 years and I started my MBA in 20, 2010 and finished it in 2012. Well, that's wonderful. Um, And I didn't really ask you, but I was curious if you could share with us. So when did you decide you wanted to become a nurse to begin with? Um, Okay, it's a little bit interesting. So I had just finished my bachelor's in health fitness management. And I love the idea of health and wellness and fitness and all of that, but there were no jobs. Um, A lot of my classmates were still um, cashiers at Sam's. And I just realized that, you know, I needed something that was going to be a little bit more secure, more stable. And I knew that I wanted to have a family and I wanted a job that was going to be there and grow with me. And I met a friend that really kind of the nurse, the first friend that I had that was a nurse. And she was over the surgery department at one of our local hospitals. And I think just a couple of weeks and I signed up and I was working on my second bachelor's. And that was 20 years ago. I still consider it one of the best decisions I've ever made. So, Well, I would imagine that you were able to bring what you had learned from your health and fitness management into the nursing profession when you're working with the patients and families. So I would, did you find that connection oh, pretty easily? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It's really interesting because now that I do, um, and I still actually dabble in a little bit of PR in home health. And um, even though I, I spend most of my time doing my consulting and stuff, I have a special spot in my heart for the elderly. And when I'm working with my elderly uh, patients, it's just like I'm working with my clients. I think nurse, nurses are like the first life coaches, the most important life and coaches and all of that health and wellness. And um, it's a whole it's a whole person approach. So. Oh, that's wonderful. That sounds very interesting. And uh, as you were talking about that, too, I was thinking about the fact that you were able to then use all the various roles that you had, the experiences to give you good perspectives as you're doing your your coaching and your consulting. Is, Is that accurate? Yes, yes. And I actually spent a couple of years in England as well. Um, doing some change management for them for the NHS. And what I found were the same problems no matter which country I was in or which organization I was in. And the way that we change, it's just it's so disruptive and it's really not that effective. And there's actually a much easier way. Um, so I think that when you just see, you know, from a whole bunch of different perspectives, and see the same things happening over and over again, um, you know, you realize, hey, it's not just this organization or this leader. It's a whole process that we do. And we've been using the same processes for years. So, Well, that'll be interesting to hear a little bit more about your experiences there. And as you're describing that, I was thinking how appropriate it is with us having the Year of the Nurse being this year. And uh, yes. the, the whole initiative on nursing now to like really be focused on nursing across the world. So we'll talk more about that. 
This is All About Nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and it's time for us to take a short break. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately 3.5 to 4 million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Patricia Fayeweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife, which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show. And uh, before the break, my guest, Tway Martin, was telling us a little bit about the fact that she's got quite a range of experiences in different roles and different settings. And she's also spent time over in England and looking at their healthcare system. And so I thought we'd go back and see how do you apply all of that to the consulting and speaking and the challenges that you're working with organizations on? What are some of the things that you're, you're spending your time helping them with? Um, yeah, so, you know, even though you would expect for them to all be, you know, quite different, even here in the U.S., from I've worked at the uh, Veterans Hospital and, you know, Level 2 Trauma Center, Hospice, uh, Critical Access Hospital, and then two years in England, and, you know, a lot of it is all different, but at the core of it, it, it's all the same. It's all patient care. It's frontline staff, you know, trying to give the best service, the best experience, the best outcomes, um, in the most efficient way possible. And, you know, everybody's battling um, budgets and, you know, finances and changes. Um, So it was quite interesting. I think one of the most interesting things, and and I actually ended up as a patient um, in England in the hospital. And when I pulled up, there was no valet parking over there. It's all meter paid parking. And I was like, okay, you know, I could, I'm from Texas. We have tons of space. We don't have a lot of that where I live. And I get into the room and my TV doesn't work. And so I'm like, oh, gosh, it's not a private room by any means. And anyway, so I called the operator to let them know that my TV didn't work. And over there, you pay for your TV. You pay like so many pounds for 24 hours to be able to watch TV. And I thought, wow, you would never see that over here in the U.S. where we are so service oriented. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's. It, it it seems like really everybody's facing the same stuff. You know, how do we how do we continue to outperform and outproduce when our staff are feeling tired? And how do we value them and lift them up? And it, it's all this. It's all the same stuff. It's the same thing everybody's going through. I feel like. I always smile when we talk about the teamwork, and I think, well, it really is a of the work of the group, because every day when you go to work, you're with potentially different people. It's not the same team members. When you do go to work and it's the same team members, it's a great day. <laughs> but I think that's yeah. one of the struggles that we have is that you can end up working with 
bunch of people that you don't know. And that ends up, as you said, you know, not allowing you to be as efficient and all that kind of stuff. So it's yes. pretty interesting. That makes a big difference when you get that teamwork and that collaboration and that that unit. And, you know, and that's something that I think is, is really suffering in healthcare. I can remember, you know, years ago when I could feel it everywhere that I was, and I don't feel that as much. And I think that's very important between departments and coworkers in the same unit. And it, it's huge. And I think it is suffering for sure. You know, I always had a hard time having people understand the cost of turnover, that it was bigger than the dollar amounts. And I tried to get people to understand that when you disrupt and you lose that knowledge worker who's been with you uh, for 10 years and they work nights and they can do anything in critical care, that is not an easy skill set that you just pluck out and you find someone oh. new to come in and take that on. And and then, as you said, I mean, the change in personnel and all of that, it just really complicates the work environment. It's so, it's a lot. It's a lot. If you can hang on to your regular staff. I worked at a place one time that had a lot of turnover and that exact situation that you were talking about where the experienced, you know, the good staff were leaving, you know, they, they had a lot of opportunity. So they no longer were choosing to work where we weren't performing well. And this hospital wasn't, um, but the, the hospital didn't recognize that, hey, you're a customer. You're a customer to this nurse. And a good nurse is going to pick to go work somewhere else. And, you know, I felt really sorry for a lot of the new nurses that I was bringing in because I brought in a lot of GNs to my floor. And I hated that that was going to be their first experience, you know. Yes, I think we've been working to change that with residencies and all of that. So are, what are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve when you work with different organizations? Um, the outcome that we that we are going for, so kind of the, the whole thing behind my book and this whole journey that I've been on um, was, was to create a better system for us to create change, um, positive change in organizations, and just change overall. Because what I've discovered is that it doesn't really matter if it's a change in your personal life or a huge, massive systems or a system redesign change at work, there's actually only five steps to change, and there's always only been five steps. So if you can know those five steps and you can learn them, you can practice them and you can master them over a lifetime. And emotional intelligence skills are, are connected right in there with those five steps. And so our goal is to help organizations realize that they can connect emotional intelligence with Lean Six Sigma or whatever change management program they're using, um, they actually connect and it's five steps. And the benefit when people learn how to create change um, anywhere they want and any time they want, they're going to sustain those skills. So I feel sure that probably everybody that I taught Lean Six Sigma to over the years that did a project here or a project there does not remember me or what I taught them. But when I take those concepts and I make them super easy in a way that's really easy to understand and easy to use, and I teach people how to use those concepts in their life to create what comes next for them, what comes next for their kids, they, they use those because it benefits them. It's their success habits. And they learn them and they practice them. They teach them to their kids. And before you know it, your employee pool has continual habits of growth and you know by the way they can also bring those to work and use them but it's a way to lift up staff improve employee engagement improve burnout decrease absenteeism and all that stuff that happens when we put people in grief over and over <laughs> and uh and and it helps you know we're nurses we are the worst about people coming over into our department and changing things for us. It doesn't matter if it's our workflow, our uniforms, our work environment. We're really funny about that. And nurses like to learn from nurses. And the language between, you know, the business side of things and the clinical side is so opposite. They speak a foreign language and we speak a foreign language to them. And, and when you can speak the same language, great things happen, great teamwork, great collaboration. 
That's great. Um, we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and we will continue this conversation when we come back. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and All About Nursing. We're live on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. And before the break, my guest, Choi Martin, was telling us a little about the change process that she uses. And she, you started to explain, too, about emotional <laughs> intelligence being part of that. And that was really resonating with me because I do a lot of coaching on emotional intelligence. And the thing I was struck with is that the most recent report that they had done across the world, empathy has dropped by 40 percent in the last 20 years. And so a lot of businesses are... Oh, yeah bringing this back in because that's just not a good thing. We've got to get that kind of uh, yes. understanding and patience back in. So maybe you could tell a bit more about what you do with emotional intelligence and the five steps of the process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So empathy, it's interesting you say that because I was, when I was in England and I was about to come back to the States, I started interviewing for positions. And so I called a friend of mine and I said, you know, I've been over here in the UK for two years. What, you know, what's going on over there? And she said, empathy, that's the really big thing. Well, I was in England and they're not doing anything on empathy over there. So I had to start doing my own research and it was the best thing that happened to me because what I discovered is so empathy is part of our emotional intelligence skills. Mm -hmm. But before we can empathize with others, the foundation skill for that is self-awareness. And it's part of kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you start at the bottom and then, you know, you go to the next level and to the next level. So you have to start with those skills. And we very rarely ever touch on those in organizations. We cherry pick the emotional intelligence skills we want, like empathy or teamwork or leadership, but it's part of a bigger picture. So, okay, so you've got emotional intelligence. There's five steps that we, that we take to uh, develop our emotional intelligence. We define the problem and pick the behavior that we want. We figure out where we are. We figure out where we're going. We figure out how we're going to get there, and then we figure out how we're going to stay there. Okay, and I went through those pretty quick, but so that's how we create emotional intelligence, and that's how we develop. And it is the single most important skill for life success, responsible for up to 80%. Um, so it's important. You want to have it as much as you can get. You want your kids to have it. You want your coworkers to have it. You want everybody to have it. So when I learned Lean Six Sigma and I, I implemented that in organizations, there's also five steps to Lean Six Sigma. 
And they are, you got to define the problem and see the possibility. You got to figure out where you are. You got to figure out where you're going. You got to figure out how to get there. And you got to figure out how to stay there. They're the exact same five steps as developing emotional intelligence. So what I discovered is part of our big problems with change management and the way that we do it is we have a really hard system like Lean Six Sigma that only a few people in the organization can learn because it's hard, it's difficult, it's expensive. So what I did was I made it easy because you can teach this to anybody if you can make it easy enough. And if you can do that, you're, you're, it's only five steps and they can learn them. So what I did is I, I created it as into a map. And so once you learn them, you're like never going to forget it because nobody remembers the five steps of Lean Six Sigma. Because it, it, if you're not using it all the time, because you're not developing the habit and you can't associate anything with it. And what I did was I took Lean Six Sigma out of Japanese, put it into simple language that a kindergartner could understand. And then the skills that we need to be successful at Lean Six Sigma are our emotional intelligence skills. So I created that interlocking those methods so that you can develop both at the same time. That's great. And um, as you were describing that, I was thinking that the reason that the emotional intelligence resonated so much for me was really learning that the only thing I could control is how I responded to other people. And so when I was having days when I thought I was working with a bunch of people, I had a lot of multiple personality disorders. It was probably me needing to take a day off. And so, you know, it was like my own check in on, okay, this is not really the way you see it. You've got to plan a little differently here. So I I think that kind of awareness and responsibility is critical. And uh, so you've had really great successes on this. Yeah, and yeah. we overlook it, and they say that, unfortunately, that the generations that are graduating now are graduating with less um, social awareness, less of all of the emotional intelligence skills than previous generations. And so I think as organizations, particularly healthcare organizations and nursing, it's like, you know, how, how do we fix that? How do we, how do we create something that's better so that, you know, because these kids are coming out of, you know, traumatic schools and school shootings and things like that. And, you know, what is it like to come into an environment, a work environment where, you know, you feel safe and you can be innovative and you feel valued. Um, And, and, you know, the bigger we get in organizations, the less often that happens sometimes. And it's, it's really important. And it, the return on investment is phenomenal. Um, every single reimbursement um, measure depends on the quality of that frontline staff and their performance and their quality and the way they use their resources. And, but yet we don't teach them how to create change. We don't teach them any of those things. And so where the most change happens Um, And at the most important point, you know, we're not doing a lot of emotional intelligence training and change training and all that. And, you know, we rely on those frontline staff to help our patients change their habits. And it's even more effective if we know how to change our own habits and be successful, you know. Yes. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about with the executives that I work with, like chief nursing officers and others, preparing for meetings, especially if you know they're going to be tense, is one of the top things that you can do so that you can really get good at being aware of, because I used to know certain people push my buttons more than others. So I had a plan Mm -hmm. better for those sessions, as you could probably relate to. And when I did that, it was... I was highly effective, and I think it was really surprising to yeah. people because I wasn't caught off guard. I did not react. It was very cool, calm, and collective, and that was actually the fun part was to watch their faces. They didn't know what to do with me. So we are coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. This is all about nursing. I'm Dr. Joyce Batcher, the host of the show, and we'll be right back. Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. 
The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it for over 50 years evelyn stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of pennsylvania president and founder of big heart bridges her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing transportation and employment Ms. Dupula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. You are listening to All About Nursing, live from the VPM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host of the show, and uh, you may hear a little bit of grumbling voices in the background. That's some... Um, thunder and lightning going on. We have a pretty big thunderstorm here in Austin. So sorry about that. So uh, let's go back to you, Toy, and have you share a little bit more about the uh, method that you use for change management. How does this really differ when you go into organizations and you start trying to help them improve things? So when I worked as a project manager, I would go in and I would, I would, um, it, it was all about, um, I would go in and teach Lean Six Sigma to a few of the leaders, and we would kind of pick the projects, and we would decide to change, and then we would push it down, and we would teach the rest of the organization kind of how to deal with the changes that we made. And it, it's just so disruptive, and it was so hard standing in front of those employees, because I know what they heard me saying was someone somewhere is changing something about the way you work. And and they tuned me out. It was so devastating. So we we do it a little bit differently. The first phase that we do is we teach everybody the skills. And that might look diff- a little bit different in, in everywhere. But, you know, not everybody wants to be involved in every project that goes in, on at work. But they do want to feel like they know what's going on. They want to understand the terminology. Um, they want to be able to get involved if they want to. But, but even more important than when that happens, when people can learn these skills and they can learn them to benefit their personal life and their performance and productivity, we don't separate work performance and productivity from life performance and productivity. So we teach those skills so that they can use them anywhere. And then, you know, in the in the second phase, after everybody, you know, the group learns how, um, you know, the basic five steps, how to use it and the ways that it benefits them, and they learn how to start using and developing those skills because it's kind of like kind of like running. You didn't start out running. You started out crawling and then walking. And change is the same way. We don't automatically, you know, get good at it. We usually get, you know, get confronted with it, and then we freak out, and then we panic, and then we try to get out of it. But very few of us ever be proactive and say, you know what, I'm going to learn these five steps so that the next time change you know, happens to me or the next time I want to create change, I have a map, I have a formula and it's only, you know, it's only the project that's different. So you develop those skills because if you don't have the skills, you certainly can't create what comes next. And it's always scary. Yeah. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about the fact that there's so many changes because that's what I used to always get from staff is, can you slow them down? and only have like two changes this next month, and the answer is, I wish, but no. And I think that's what has made it harder. 
It is, it is. And you know what, when I'm, when I'm speaking, one of the things that I make a comparison to, when you're in leadership and you've got change going on, it's like, you know, five or ten people picking up a really heavy rope and trying to get some momentum out of it spinning. And it's hard, it's heavy, it takes a little bit. But by the time they get that momentum going, the little guy holding on to the rope at the end, he is swinging around really fast. And that's what the employees feel like on the other end. And that's what I hear, you know, over and over again. You know what's interesting I see over and over is that every, pretty much every single time I've been hired to go in and work as a project manager, it's always, the project is always coming from the finance department or the quality department. It very rarely ever is coming straight from the nursing department. And what I find is that they have things on the unit that they wanted changed and that they wanted to, you know, that aren't working well. But those get overlooked because you've got these bigger um, issues that are related to reimbursement and core measures and, and all of that stuff. But it, it, it's all so connected that it, it's amazing what happens when when the staff on the front line um, feel engaged and feel like they know what's going on and can be active. We spend a lot of time in leadership trying to figure out how to change the processes on the front line rather than teaching the people on the front line to change their processes on the front line. Yeah, and I think you said it earlier too, is uh, learning the language that you should use when you have finance people around and getting comfortable with telling some of them what the value of the work is that you're leading, what the return on investment would be, you know, why they can't ignore you because this outcome is tied to this particular metric that you know is in your incentive plan. And that's a lot of what yeah. I used to do was really make sure staff understood that so that they were able Absolutely. to use those those words and I always paid attention to what my boss said and where he went and what he was reading. So I also learned how to change my language so that I matched what he was doing. So I think that's our responsibility on the nursing side is to get comfortable with that and, and also invite your finance people to the clinical side of the world because they need to see it to understand that productivity and other things that they look at are, are metrics, but they're not perfect. You know, so, um, yes. Well, you know, that's that important, that first step, you know, picking the wrong prop, picking the right problem and the right possibility. I worked for an organization one time that built a huge parking lot to fix a problem that ultimately got fixed by changing a postcard. And they picked the wrong problem. They went after the wrong possibility. And lo and behold, the problem was still there after that. And there were so many more problems attached to it. And that, that first part in, in picking the right problem and the right possibility, you know, that takes the business people, the clinical people, um, you know, sitting there together, talking the same language and um, after the same goal to make, to make that happen. Because it's really easy to to forget that we are all on the same team and we're after the same goals. And when we have bad processes um, that don't flow well and don't make sense, it really causes a lot of distinction between departments and creates a we, they phenomena and all kinds of bad things that just don't go well. <laughs> well, and I think sometimes we forget that it's really not about lab getting their way or pharmacy or nursing, it's about the patient and what's needed and what systems need to work so that the yeah. cure is seamless and it's good. And so, yeah, I tease about the sponge. Do you know what sponge, S-P-O-N-G-E stands for? It's a uh, no. society of protecting the organization for nursing getting everything. So it's like... <laughs> It's like people think that, you know, nurses, nurses get everything, and, and it's not that. It's what you need in order to give good patient care. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is all about nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the Beacon Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and it's time for a short break. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences 
that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern. Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network in Tune and Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batcher, the host of this show, and my guest this evening is Toy Martin, who has been sharing a lot of the work she's been leading around change management and trying to help organizations with some of their key challenges. And you know, you've been talking about emotional intelligence and the change model that you're using. Maybe you could share a little bit about the short and long-term outcomes of, of the staff developing emotional intelligence like what have you seen um so with you know we were talking earlier about uh the meetings that you went to and that some of the people who pushed your buttons how easy it was and you know to kind of lose your cool and for meetings to get off track i think that that's some of the most immediate results that i see is that the environment just kind of relaxes and people start to feel safe because you you get some sense that you kind of know what's going to happen next. You feel um, you're you're in the present. Your self awareness is better, and and our lives are like there's so much going on. There's so much change everywhere. Because I mean, never mind all the the stuff that changes at work. You know, what about our kids at home, our families at home? When we look at the statistics on all of that, you know, those people aren't doing as well as they were five years ago. So we have we have a lot of stuff all over around us. And when when we can develop our emotional intelligence skills and start working on um, that mental well-being, that's kind of the domino effect for everything that follows because our thoughts guide every single word we say, every single action we make. So you really can't create change in your actions unless you create change in your thoughts. And that's the emotional intelligence part. So that immediate um, um, feeling of, of calmness, and, and it's about respect. We really can't respect other people or understand them until we respect and understand ourselves. And when we're working in an environment where we don't really know if we've got friends or foe, you know, working next to us, and you know, maybe the collaboration isn't great and the teamwork isn't isn't good, and you're afraid to speak up. You know, any kind of growth or great ideas that could come from the front line to create better ways of working and stuff, they don't happen because people don't feel safe. And when people don't feel safe, they can't help make patients feel safe. And it's just the domino effect that the key, those people at the bedside, um, it's immediate what happens when you feel like you're in a great environment and you feel valued. You feel, you know, you have hope. You can create what comes next. And you feel like you, um, you're you important and you're included. And I think some of what you're describing is going to become even more essential as we're really continuing to see more patients that are positive oh. with COVID-19 and the stresses oh, that yeah. are in the work environments and, as you said, at home as well. So uh, I would imagine that the whole mental health issue is going to just oh, continue yeah. to be... 
yeah. major. Yeah, you know, and I think nurses and all front, and when I say nurses, I mean healthcare staff in general. Nurses are just the biggest population, uh, you know, and so you can, I can speak, you can speak to them, but this is all frontline people, and it's not isolated to just healthcare. It's, it's, it's everywhere that it is, but it, it's so important, and that, um, that ability to take care of yourself amidst, you know, financial worries and all of that. And is is a big deal because it's very easy to get burned out when you're continually giving and giving to your patients and helping them and healing them. And, you know, it's like the, the oxygen mask dropping from the airplane ceiling. You know, we, we can't put it on other people without putting it on ourselves first because, you know, I, I did some math. And an average med surge nurse will see up to 1,728 patients in a year. So that's almost 2,000 patients that one nurse will touch their lives every year. And that's a big deal. So one of my, one of my favorite things and, about my career and all of that is that during this COVID crisis, I've had, I think, five Ex patients that I've that I've uh, discharged from home health sometime over the last two years that called to check on me to call to tell me that they were doing good to call and tell me thank you and all of that and those relationships you I I couldn't do that for them if I wasn't doing it for myself first and if I didn't know how to do it for myself first to help them see through this this maybe a dark time and physical change in their life and trying to change the way they eat I I couldn't successfully coach them if I couldn't do it myself and I think that's one of the biggest benefits to realizing how important nurses are on the front line for creating change and how important those skills are those five steps no matter where you use them they're so important yeah, I, and thank you for raising that in terms of some of your former patients calling you, because it really is about relationships, and as you've been describing this evening. And uh, I was also reading that social isolationism, I know that that was something that a uh, couple of guests that I had on a show from AARP talked about how they're concerned about that for uh, uh, our mm-hmm. older population. But in fact, we're experiencing that a lot right now across the globe and how people are managing working from home and not yeah. and, and uh, whether or not they have a strong network or not is really playing out. Are you seeing some of that in the work you're doing as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, first of all, I, I'm not able to go in and speak in the big groups like I used to, which, of course, I miss and I feel that very much. Um, you know, I feel it. I feel it everywhere. I feel it in all of the facilities that I'm in. On a personal note, my mom um, has Alzheimer's. She's stage six and she's been in a nursing home for the last two years. And, you know, it's been eight weeks since um, I've been able to see her, and, and, and I hate that. But, you know, in communicating with the staff and, you know, seeing what they're going through, and, you know, these these people are taking extra precautions to be extra safe. And, you know, a lot of them can't afford the insurance where they work, and they're worried about getting sick. And they have family members, you know, that are struggling. And then they're, they're still there taking care of my mom, um, you know, because I'm not there. And, and I do, you know, whenever stress is high, you know, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a thermostat. And we're all some level on that thermostat on our stress level, Um, you know, all the way from, you know, really cold and just mellow all the way to very hot and just about, you know, to run around with our head, you know, like a chicken with our head cut off. We're somewhere on there. And the more emotional intelligence we have, the more we can control that thermometer so that we are um, always being um, how we want to be. You know, we're not... We're not, you know, coming back always apologizing later for overstepping <laughs> our goodness. That's great. Uh, this is All About Nursing. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. We're live on the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio, and we'll continue this conversation when we come back. 
Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the real realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca. 819-360-3266. Now is your time. Introducing betterhomeandgarden.com. That's www.betterhomeandgarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. Betterhomeandgarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, betterhomeandgarden.com. Betterhomeandgarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor covering, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale. An international initiative called Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor, and All About Nursing, live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And my guest this evening, Toy Martin, was sharing more about the work that she's been leading and some of the things that she's worked with organizations trying to improve different outcomes. Uh, maybe you could share with the, our listeners how people would get in touch with you. And I, I know that you also mentioned the, the book that you've published. Maybe you could share a little bit more about where people would find that information and the kinds of things you are involved in. Yes, yes. So the name of my book is called Living Your Life with Possibilities. Um, best place, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Best place to get it is directly from my website, which is toymartin.com. That's T O I E M A R T I N dot com. Um, it's got free shipping and all of that. Um, that's the best place to get it. You can find me on LinkedIn. I post stuff um, frequently on there, and um, they can contact me through there if they're interested in, um, you know, team building. They've got a change project coming up. Um, they're looking, you know, for empathy training, everything kind of related around that. Um, I do a lot of that. It's also connected. And they can um, contact me um, through my website um, and get in touch with me that way. So, so Toy, um, are, you, are you doing any of these things on a virtual platform with people? Um, yes. Um, a lot of the one-to-ones, um, we have been able to move to more of a virtual one. Unfortunately, I didn't have all of my stuff ready in like a web-based format um, yet. Um, so I'm not able to do big classes in my virtual one yet, but we are through video and all that, which is really nice. You know, it's not quite the same as being able to connect with people um, face-to-face, but it is better 
um, you know, it is better than not being able to do it at all. So we are able to do um, some virtual through video and things like that. That's great. And you have really shared a lot of different ideas this evening. And I was just curious if you had like one or two things you want to make sure the audience really, really that's been listening this evening really remembers. What would that be? Uh, you know, I think the most important thing is that for people to realize that h- how important change is at, to the quality of our lives, that it's so um, it's Uh, change is so important in our lives that it's actually in the definition of life. It says in part that it's the continual change preceding death. And, you know, we never take the time, take the time to stop and think, do I know the five steps to change? Do I have a formula? So the next time I'm faced with change or want to make a change, then I know what to do. I'm practiced. I've got the habits and things like that. And it, it's not as hard. It doesn't have to be as scary as we're making it. We don't have to use a grease curve. I did a modified um, change curve to where, you know, you know what's going on. It's optimistic and it's not so um, it's more possibility focused. And just, you know, every possibility comes from at least a little bit of change. Um, So don't be scared of it. Be brave and, you know, go for what you want and what what your values are and what's important because one person can make a difference. That's wonderful. I I really appreciated you being on the show and you certainly have a lot of really great experiences. And again, you may want to just say what your website is one more time before the show ends because we're going to be wrapping up in just a few minutes here. Say that one more time, Toy. Absolutely. It's toymartin.com. It's T-O-I-E Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N.com. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, I really appreciate <clears throat> excuse me, having you on the show. Hopefully the noise in the background with the thunder that was going on wasn't too distressing for people. But uh, I hope that you all will tune in again next week. You've been listening to All About Nursing, live from the BBM Global Network in TuneIn Radio. I'm Dr. Joyce Batchelor, the host, and that's it for tonight. Thank you. You've been listening to All About Nursing with your host, Dr. Joyce Batchelor. Tune in each week and get a daily dose of nursing and the healthcare services they provide and how nurses are finding innovative ways to address the key healthcare issues they're facing today. Here on Dr. Joyce Batchelor's All About Nursing. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.